Uh, we are now moving to men, and the largest cohort that I know of in the world on this topic is Anna's, so she will, I will get out of the way right away. And I was very happy to hear about my uh, sexual uh, things as an adolescent. It finally explained some things that I've been dealing with. For... <laughs> Well, I, I tried to get my 13-year-old son to garden and um, play music, and that, that isn't working. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I, so while we get the technology going, I'll just do a bit of an introduction. Um, so we know so much about cervical cancer and HPV, and it really, you can see how it quickly led to the development of vaccine, and then now really licensure and dissemination around the world. Um, our interest in men really started because we cared about women. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, some of the most important studies were with Javier Bosch, looking at what's called the male factor, what are the factors that influence HPV and disease risk in women, and men were clearly identified as one of those important factors. So many of the studies that were first started with men were really focused on men as a risk factor for cervical cancer for women. Um, and one of the big questions was because at the time, we really thought about disease in women related to HPV, but not disease in men. And so the thought was, how could you ever even conduct a study like this? Why would men ever enroll in, in, a, in a study and stay on study to look at natural history? Um, and, and in fact, there was a lot of skepticism about doing that. And when we first designed this, this um, international cohort, we got a lot of pushback from reviewers. And a lot of people said, you know, great idea, I think you need to do that. Uh, why don't you go and try it? I was very pleased to see that almost every speaker has now acknowledged the importance of HPV to cancer in men. And so clearly our thinking has changed, but now we have to quickly catch up and understand what those diseases are in men, the proportion of those cancers in men that are caused by HPV, and what is the natural history of those infections leading to those cancers. And in fact, so um, the early studies were focused on men attending sexually transmitted infection clinics, which is going to give you a biased view of infection in men, right? So we try, what we said is we want to enroll a general population. So if I can ever get the slides to work, what I want to do is walk you through some of the lessons we've learned about infection in men. And a lot of it is comparing men to women as well as understanding immune response to these natural infections in men, and then what we can do about it. Oh, okay, so here we go. Um, so, oh, here's my disclosure. Um, all right, so this is an important review. You heard from Javi Bosch that almost 100% of cervical cancers are caused by HPV. It's important to note that it's different in men. So for the, um, for the non-cancerous lesions, the majority are caused by HPV, but these are with the lowest types, HPV 6 and 11. But for the cancers, there is variability across the anatomic sites in the proportion of those cancers caused by HPV. And unlike cervical cancer, the overwhelming majority majority of the types that cause these cancers in men are due to HPV-16 and a minor component to HPV-18. Now the other really important take-home message that's different about men and women is that unlike cervical cancer, there is no routine screening to detect and treat precancerous lesions in men. So we don't have a secondary prevention method the way we do for women at the cervix. Now, this is a rare cancer, penile cancer, but it is a horrible cancer. And similar to what Javi Bosch said, we really don't know what the incidence of this cancer is outside of the countries where we have really good registries. And the problem with that is we suspect that the incidence is much higher, as in three to five-fold higher, in the developing world, such as countries in Africa like Uganda and in parts of Brazil. The other the big difference is unlike cervical cancer, penile cancer is really a cancer of much older men, which makes it a challenge to study in terms of cohort studies, as well as in terms of vaccination trials to look at this as an endpoint in the vaccine trial. 
It also has some significant health disparities associated with it. p l cancer in the U.S. is lowest among Asians, which, by the way, is true for almost every cancer that we look at. Asians have much lower cancer incidence. But what we find, and I'm sorry the, the visual is not that great on this, is that the incidence is significantly higher among Hispanics. Um, and in fact, if we look at Latin America, the incidence of PNL cancer is higher in Latin America as well as among Hispanics in the U.S. than in North America and non-Hispanics. The other cancer that's important to note is anal cancer. This also causes significant morbidity and mortality, and this is in both men and women. The majority is caused by HPV-16, and in the United States and many parts of Europe where we have good registries, we see that the incidence is significantly increasing in both men and women. And for the male component, what we find is that the increase is largely driven by men who have sex with men and the anal cancer lesions that are developed in that population. And in fact, if we look at the incidence of anal cancer in men who have sex with men, it's around 30-fold higher than heterosexual men. And those infected with HIV, it's 80-fold higher. And then, of course, we're seeing, again, increases in genital warts in both men and women. And again, this has been replicated in many countries around the world where genital warts are examined. Okay, so what do we know about the epidemiology? And like I said, we know very little. Um, we've been quickly trying to fill in this information gap. So I'm going to be pulling a lot of the information from our own study, which we have in collaboration with Brazil, Mexico, as well as the United States. And we purposefully chose those sites for two reasons. One, we have colleagues with phenomenal expertise in running cohort studies, phenomenal expertise in HPV. And this is where the risk of disease is really high, is in Latin America. So it was a good opportunity to synergize, as, as, uh, as we heard earlier, to really develop a powerful study to answer the questions. So the first question is, where do you find HPV in men? And you can see that it's actually quite common across the genital epithelium. It's most common at the penile shaft the tip of penis, and the scrotum. Now, of course, these are all contributing to transmission as well as to disease. Now, in this heterosexual population, we were the first to show that heterosexual men also have HPV at the anal canal. Now, I want you to remember that because that's an important contribution to the anal cancer that we see in the general male population throughout the world. And in fact, when we compare the genital infection across anatomic sites, what we have quickly learned is that this infection for the same sexual behavior has a very different prevalence depending on the location in the body. So for example, the infection is very high at the genitals, around 50%, which is actually higher than what we've seen in females at the cervix. But when we look at anal canal, it's lower at 12%. But look at oral HPV infection. Within the same cohort for the same sexual behavior, much lower prevalence of oral HPV than genital HPV. So what's emerging is this understanding that the infection behaves differently, not only comparing men to women, but within men at different anatomic sites. And what we want to do is use this information to inform our understanding of disease progression and potentially the development of screening tools that are appropriate for each of these cancer sites. Um, similar to the work that's been done at the cervix, we're interested in understanding what influences an HPV infection in men. And this is very similar to what you've seen for the female studies. Obviously, sexual behavior is most important, but a recurring theme is tobacco exposure. And this seems to be important at every anatomic site that we have evaluated in men and similar to what you've seen in women. So it seems to contribute to this natural history. We also see um, some interesting associations with other factors that are modifiable, like condom use, um, and circumcision, which remains one of the more important issues to date about how we can use it as a prevention tool for a variety of sexually transmitted infections. Now, in terms of the acquisition of new infections, you saw earlier from Suzanne Kerr's presentation that the prevalence of HPV at the cervix is highest in young women, seems to decrease with age, and in some countries there's a second peak. 
when we look at the acquisition of HPV infection in men, we do not see those same trends. What we see is that regardless of age, so all the lines are overlapping, men remain at risk for acquiring a new infection at the same rate in an older age group as they did in a younger age group. And this contrasts to the work that you see here by Nubia Munoz, where each of these lines is a different age, and you can see that the risk significantly varies by age, with older women having a lower risk of acquiring a new infection. Because persistence is such an important factor in disease progression, we then ask the same question. Um, in men, what is the rate of clearing an infection, which is corollary to persistence? And what we find is that in men, the, the, the median duration of infection is around seven months. So 50% of men will clear fairly rapidly. Um, but what's interesting is for HPV 16, similar to what we've seen at the cervix, this particular type behaves the same. It is more persistent. So there is a longer duration of infection. Fewer men are clearing it. And what we find is that, that men who are older are clearing slightly faster. And in fact, just to highlight when we compare men to women, although the infections of the other types seem to clear faster in men, HPV 16 seems to hold on to its persistence in men in the same way that it does in females. Now remember, HPV 16 is the one type that is most strongly associated with cancer in men. So this is a significant finding. Um, we're also really interested now in taking our infection data and following the cohort for disease. So I'm just going to show you a couple of slides where we're in the process still of, of collecting all this information. And what you see is that this is the risk of developing condyloma after an initial HPV infection. And you can see that it's HPV 6 and 11 that has one of the highest risks for developing the genital wart. But what's really important is how quickly that genital wart develops after the initial infection. Now, please remember this, because as you go through the conference, you're going to see that our first results of effectiveness. Does the vaccine work in a population? We're all seeing the genital wart data being presented. And the reason for that is that it's a lesion that so rapidly develops after infection, it's sort of the, the hallmark of what allows us to first detect whether the vaccine is working. So you saw some of the data with women. You're going to see more throughout this conference. Um, so very rapid. And you see other infections contribute to genital warts, but not nearly as, an, as an important a role as 6 and 11. We're also following the cohort for precancerous lesions of the penile epithelium. As I showed you, penile cancer is a much older man's disease. And it's a rare disease. So these are very few lesions that are developing. We are following them. And you can see, unlike genital warts, it is much rarer. It does occur. And we're in the process of continuing the follow-up to get a better handle of the characteristics of these lesions, time to lesion development, the types that are involved, and what are the factors that influence that natural history to lesion. So what about antibodies? Why is it that the men seem to remain at risk for a new infection throughout their lifespan? So here's a male-female comparison. And I just want to highlight these um, high bars that you see here are from studies of sexually transmitted infection populations. These are very high-risk populations. So more exposure, more antibody. And these are the studies from more um, population um, individuals. Regardless of the population, the prevalence of the antibody for 16 is significantly higher in women compared to men. And that is true in every study that has been evaluated. And in fact, when we look at um, whether the antibody, although it's present in a lower proportion in men, does it have any function? In our study, within the HIMSS study, we see that there is no protection. So what does that mean? Yes, men do develop an antibody, much smaller rate than in females. And when they do develop the antibody, it appears not to be protective. Now, again, this is antibody to natural infection, not antibody to vaccine. Um, well, of the men who do develop an antibody, where is that infection? And it turns out when we ask that question, I just want you to note, it's only among the men who happen to have an anal infection that have an increased probability of actually having 
a, an antibody to HPV-16. So it looks like the keratinized skin of the penis is not a very good um, epithelium to generate that natural immunity, but the infection at the anal canal is. Um, and the anal canal we think of is very similar to the cervix, and this may help explain some of the male-female differences that we see. The good news is that we do have um, a vaccine. It has been tested in women, um, in men rather, as well as in women. And I'm just going to show you quickly the results of that. So what we see here, this is a young population of men that were enrolled to the vaccine trial. And because they were young, the majority of the lesions that were um, that were collected were condyloma or genital warts. We also assessed the precancerous lesions of the penile epithelium, but in this young population, there are very few lesions that occurred. So what you see is very robust efficacy against genital warts in males. And I just want you to know, because I think this is a hint for what we could see if we enrolled an older population and followed them, that the three cases of PIN that did occur all occurred in the placebo group and not in the vaccine group. I want to remind everyone that anal HPV infection is very high among men who have sex with men, but is also at a relatively high prevalence among men who only have sex with women. Again, the contribution to anal cancer. And in the same vaccine trial in men, um, we did a, there was a sub-study that was conducted on, among men who have sex with men and looking at anal lesions, and I want you to see very robust efficacy against the anal lesions, um, similar to what we saw for protection against condyloma in men. Um, so we now have a licensed vaccine for men in several different countries, and it's licensed to protect against genital warts and anal cancer. But I want to highlight that we are still very far away from what we can accomplish in men. We still do not have an indication for the prevention of penile cancer or oropharyngeal cancer, nor do we have any secondary prevention methods available to us for any of the cancers that HPV causes in men. So there's a lot of work that remains to be done into the future. So in summary, HPV causes a significant cancer and non-cancer disease burden in women as well as men. Unlike cervical cancer, there is no reliable cost-effective method for screening secondary prevention to prevent the cancers. We are learning quickly that HPV prevalence in men significantly varies by anatomic site. It's higher at the genitals, followed by the anal canal, and lowest at the oral cavity. Only a minority of men develop an antibody following HPV infection, so they remain at risk for this infection throughout their lifespan. We do have a vaccine. The one vaccine is a four-valent vaccine that is efficacious in reducing HPV-related genital and anal infection and genital warts and precancerous lesions of the anal canal in males. And I just want to acknowledge this is our team. It's huge. Um, so we talk about collaboration. It's been an amazing um, past eight, nine years now. We're looking forward to a bright future trying to fill in some more of this information. Thank you.